Hi, and welcome to Fair Perspectives, the official podcast of the pro-human movement brought to you by the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. I'm your host, Angel Eduardo, and my co-host, who you will hear from shortly, is Melissa Chen. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Jonathan Haidt. Jonathan is a social psychologist, professor, and author whose research examines the intuitive foundations of morality and how morality varies across cultures, including the cultures of progressives, conservatives, and libertarians. He is the author of The Happiness Hypothesis and of the two New York Times bestsellers, The Righteous Mind and The Coddling of the American Mind, which he co-authored with Greg Lukianoff. We chat with Jonathan about his recent Atlantic article, Why the Past 10 Years of American Life Have Been Uniquely Stupid, Social Media and Its Effects on Our Discourse and Culture, The Need for a Shared Story, The Importance of Dissent, The Distinctions Between Liberalism and Conservatism, The Global Impact of America's Dissent into What He Calls Structural Stupidity, and What Measures We Can Take to Improve It. Ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan Haidt. Jonathan Haidt, welcome to Fair Perspectives. What a pleasure to be here, Melissa and Angel. I love Fair. Well, we love oh, you. That's good. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, you know, been following your work for a long, long time, and I think you you rescued me from being kind of a, a Kantian. You know, I used to be a Kantian in my approach to my understanding of morality, and uh, now you're a Humean. Yeah, I, I've I've come to acknowledge that. I, I, it, you know, it, it goes against my my being to to believe the Humean side of things, but but you've convinced me um, over the years. And um, well, recently we w- we want to dive into this bombshell of an Atlantic article that you wrote. Um, it it is titled "Why the Last What Ten Years uh, of American Life Has Been Uniquely Stupid." Um, and I think uniquely is doing a lot of heavy, heavy lifting here. So um, maybe it'll be, it'll be helpful to the audience to kind of just like sum up mm-hmm. what your arguments are in this. Sure, essay. sure. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll just back up and especially I think for this audience, uh, you know, I think people are very aware that something weird began happening in the 2010s. And it first, it sort of first came to earth on campus as that we were visited by some sort of space aliens or some weird ionic cloud and it set down, uh, you know, the campus of Silliman College at Yale or whatever origin story you want to tell. Stuff got weird uh, beginning in 2014 and then really exploding in 2015, but it was just on campus. Um, and then a couple years later, looking back at some data, people pointed out, actually, no, there was this great awakening. It was like something happened to, uh, to progressive politics more around 2015. And then it floods into journalism around 2018. And wherever it goes, the same pattern of stuff happens. So that's sort of the story that would be very familiar to people at FAIR, that it's like something happened to left-leaning organizations. Uh, well, it's more than that. <clears throat> um, I'm a social psychologist, and I, I, I just had the sense in 2014, 2015, that something changed in the basic fabric of space-time, like in the basic of like social space-time, of like the way we're all connected. And, and I had this general sense that it had something to do with social media, just that it just connected us in ways that were new and that had all kinds of unanticipated effects. And I've been struggling to make sense of it ever since, ever since Greg and I wrote that cod- the article, The Coddling of the American Mind in the Atlantic in 2015. And so I, I think a lot about metaphors. I think we can't understand anything new unless we can assimilate it to something that's already in our heads. So I've been playing around with a lot of metaphors. And I don't remember when I... I, I came back across the Babel metaphor, you know, this very short story in the early in Genesis of the Tower of Babel. But the key line in that story is God says, you know, he's offended that humans are building this tower to make a name for themselves and so they can't be flooded again because this is a few generations after Noah. Um, and God says, let us go down and confound their language so that they may not understand one another. And when I reread that, I, I don't remember what it was a year or two ago, I thought, oh my God, wow, yes, this is what has happened to us. And so I, I, I have just all these ideas about what's gone wrong. I was going to write a book on it. I'm trying to write a book on it. But I'm so concerned about how fast things are changing, how fast things are falling apart, that I wanted to get the ideas out as quickly as possible. So I talked to the people I know at The Atlantic and said, can I write this up as an article? And they said, yes. Um, and so the basic idea is that um, social media, as it changed in 2009 to 2012, it became much more viral, much more explosive. You got the like button, the retweet button. It wasn't just, hey, look at the photos of my dogs. It was, you know, do you want to retweet this, like this? Everything gets algorithm size. So my argument is that changes in the architecture, especially 20, 2009 to 2012, 
changed the way we interacted with each other. And especially social, it made social media really good at attacking people. You could launch, a, a, you could accuse someone of something, you could say something terrible about them, you could screenshot something. And if you did it really well, to be really nasty or really clever, it could get literally millions of views within a day or two. And so this, I believe, changed a lot of, it just changed things in so many ways. One of which is a lot of us just feel we're walking on eggshells. Um, any one word out of place and, it, and not even out of place, just someone takes offense at one word. And before you know it, you have you know a week or two of people hating on you and demanding you be fired. So that's the basic argument that that changed social media, changed the social connectivity in ways that are destroying many of our institutions from the inside to say nothing about teen mental health, which we can talk about as a separate part of the conversation. Yeah. Now, who is God in this metaphor? Is it Mark Zuckerberg or? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so, um, so, you know, perhaps like many in the audience, I've lost money. Uh, I was going to say investing in cryptocurrencies, but I'll just say gambling and speculating. <laughs> <laughs> um, and one of the things, but one of the things that, you know, it's kind of fun about it, it's just learning about the blockchain and decentralized finance and just realizing that the technology makes it possible to have all kinds of things without anybody in charge. And so many have observed, and this began in 2015. We, uh, so I founded Heterox Academy. I co-founded that with some other, uh, other social scientists. And some of our members from Eastern Europe were saying, this is just like what we had in the communist countries. I mean, the fear of speaking up, the, the witch trials, the, the purity spirals. Um, you know, and so people, ever since then, people have been using these metaphors, like what's happening on campus, what's happening, uh, you know, that what we're all talking about is somehow like the totalitarian countries. But yet, there's no dictator. There's no totalitarian person or authority or office. So I think what yeah. we have is you might call detote. It's decentralized totalitarianism. And what that means is, so, so the difference between totalitarian and a dictator, as I understand, is a dictator tells you what he wants and he'll kill you if you don't do it. Uh, but totalitarianism means it gets into the totality of your life. We're going to control how you raise your kids, what you think, the food you eat, the science, everything. We're going to control everything. And that's very hard to do. It's only been tried a few times. Certainly, the, you know, the Russians, the Chinese... Uh, there are a few, only a few countries that really try to control everything about your life. And in a way, um, you know, this thing that we call wokeness um, is, you know, it has elements that are totalitarian, but there's no person, there's no authority. So you have, when everybody can report everybody, when everybody can shame everybody, you get human behavior reacting as if we were in a totalitarian country, but yet there's no totalitarian. Mm. So it's like ground, it's like bottom up kind of censorship versus a, a top down almost. Yeah, but it's more just like inside out. It's just it's just all pervasive. You know, it's like it, it's like mm -hmm. you know we took away the air that we were you know breathing and replaced. No, that's not a good metaphor. Something it, we we need a metaphor that somehow gets at like this weird new form of connectivity. Well, I, I think mm -hmm. Angel's question was interesting because, and this is kind of really a, a slight pushback on just to challenge your narrative. Um, well, if his question was, who is God in this metaphor? And mm -hmm. I was thinking, you know, I, I, I love what you do at Heterox Academy. I think it's so important to promote viewpoint diversity, especially in academia, especially there. I mean, yeah. it's, <laughs> if not there, then where? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and you talk about how, you know, welcoming that is a sign of, it, it helps to, uh, at least lower structural stupidity, right? Like when we have uh, this kind of a, a climate where civil dialogue is possible and different narratives are tolerated, um, the collective um, intelligence of, of that institution just goes up. And I, I was wondering, you know, in, in your analogy of the Tower of Babel, when it comes to media, right? Um, mm -hmm. It is often characterized that the fragmentation of the media is actually a bad thing. And that is mm -hmm. all these narratives as, as you, you quoted Steve Bannon that his uh, attitude to it was, you know, flood the zone with shit, literally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. um, actually not literally, figuratively. But <laughs> so... <right>. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for using that correctly. Sorry, sorry. You're the only person uh, in the last three years to use that word sorry. correctly. <laughs> oh, I would get skewered by yeah. Stephen Pinker if I didn't. Um, mm -hmm. the, so, you know, I, if you think about certain stories that the, the news media, when there were a few gatekeepers got wrong mm -hmm. before social media. And, 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 you know, the first thing comes to mind is, is the Iraq war, the lead up to the Iraq war. Um, you know, that can be seen as 
as as the as the god right that the mm-hmm. media yeah. was trying was was god yeah. and that without challenging without breaking down it, i just imagine mm. a world where there was social media at the time and we were able to have this discussion um and and people were you know the the anti hawks the the peaceniks could mm-hmm. challenge the the prevailing narrative mm-hmm. at the time would things have been different i i, I wonder yeah. about that yeah, so here, let's pay attention to the language here. Use the word gatekeepers, which is commonly used. Once you call it gatekeepers, the normal reaction of most people is, oh, well, who, who are they to keep me out, like to keep everyone out? Like gatekeepers are bad. Um, and um, and also words like, you know, you didn't use the word authority, but the idea that there are authorities, you know, especially if you're sort of, you know, center left as, as sort of most people on campus are like left, center left, or maybe center. Uh, there's an instant instinctive reaction to like authorities gatekeepers. Um, but uh, from studying, you know, my early work was on moral foundations theory. It was on how morality varies across cultures. And just coming to see that, that authority is a moral foundation, which many cultures build on, many cultures don't. Egalitarian cultures, egalitarian movements like Occupy Wall Street, um, they, they see certain, certain injustices very clearly, but they can't actually do anything. They're, they're really not able to act. You need authority, some sort of authority to be able to act. You also need some sort of shared meaning. And this is actually where I want to try to change people away from gatekeepers and talk. Let, let's look instead at, at do we have any possibility of shared stories while also leaving plenty of room for smaller groups and micro stories? So if all we had was one television network, I mean, that's what they had in Egypt and totalitarian countries. They have one network and that's it. Okay, that's horrible. That's the worst possible environment. Um, and you know what we had in America in the you know from the fifties through the seventies was three networks plus a bunch of little UHF things. And if you moved the coat hanger antenna, maybe you could pick up some Spanish language. I mean, so you know there was basically three television networks. Now there were lots of newspapers, so it's not as though there was a totalitarian control. But you know, three television networks was not enough. And there, there was PBS. There was a few others. Um, so you know, many people saw cable TV as like good. And there's na- now there's narrow casting. You can have a station just for bowling, just for tennis or for cooking or for right-wing <laughs> politics or left-wing politics. So I think in general, you'd have to say, just without knowing details, you'd have to say, that sounds pretty good. You know, you want a media environment that people can get stories out. There's no reason that, to stop people from expressing themselves. So when we use the word fragmentation, fragmentation doesn't mean lots of little things. What it means is the breakup of any big thing. And this is what is alarming me. So it's great. I mean, so mm-hmm. I actually think that we had a golden age of the internet and it was around like 2000 to 2005 uh, when we had blogs and YouTube. I mean, we're still in a, we're still in an intellectual renaissance thanks to this technology with blogs and podcasts. I think the, the blog and podcast universe is incredible. And it's been that way since you know, the late nineties, early two thousands. So when technology mm-hmm. helps us get our story, that's great. But, but part of what happened was because uh, as social media changed and as um, um, uh, Martin Gurry says, uh, everybody should read Martin Gurry, The Revolt of the Public. He says, social, he says distributed networks are, are excellent at tearing down, but they're very bad at building up. And so what's happened, it's not just that like everyone has a voice on blogs and podcasts. Everyone can publish their own paper. Wait, wait, that's great. It's there will never again be the possibility of any shared understanding of anything. Um, so, you know, 9-11 was probably the last time when we had some sense of national consciousness. Um, I would say the slap was the other one. Um, you know, everybody, you know, the slap at the Oscars or whatever, it was like everybody, <laughs> like everybody saw it, everybody heard about it, but it was just a reason for fighting. It wasn't the same. So, you know, we can have these brief stupid yeah. moments of shared stupidity, but they don't bring us together. They divide us. 9-11 is probably the last time mm. we had any you know, real sense of shared, shared consciousness. Um, you know, when I was growing up, there was the moon landing. There were all there were all kinds of things that we experienced as a country. The Olympics, you know, and there was also like you would watch yeah. things at the same time as other people. So there was a lot more synchrony. Now everything is not just desynchronized, but it, everything's fragmented. There's no possibility of shares, and that means we have exactly what Emil Durkheim called anomy, normlessness, a nomi, the lack of norms, the lack of any sense of shared feeling. So that I think that's what yeah. the Babel metaphor is supposed to get at. That mm. That to have a successful society, it's great to have lots of voices, but you also need some ability sometimes to have a shared sense of who we are, what's happened to us, what we're trying to do. And that 
that's what I grew up with, and that is gone, and I don't think that's ever coming back. You said so much there. I would love to jump on, but I keep thinking back. Well, the first thing is I'm reminded of you know that moment when you find yourself at a funeral and you're like, oh, maybe this will wake everybody up and have them, you know, have the siblings who haven't talked in 10 years realize how stupid that is. And, you know, maybe for, for, you know, that that's what, this is what it took to kind of shake people out of that, that, you know, wasteful kind of way of being, but it only really lasts a little bit, you know, they'll get along for a couple of days. That's right. And then yeah, that's right. so COVID, right. So COVID, yeah, COVID was that <laughs> COVID was that. Uh, now, of course, historically, plagues don't unite people. Wars unite people. That's the you know being attacked right. by foreign enemies, by far the most powerful way to unite people. And that happened on nine yeah. eleven. And a lot of people thought that COVID was like that, but it wasn't. Um, plagues historically have divided people because mm. we're afraid of others and we're, we don't have enough food and we don't want you know. This time we had enough food, although mm. we didn't have enough toilet paper. It looked like for a couple of weeks. Um, but <laughs> but that you know, but actually yeah. you know. But facing this global, it was actually kind of cool. The first time in human history that the entire planet has faced something together. And there were moments of real beauty and elevation in, in February and March, you know, yeah. as Italy locked down and different countries locked down. And, um, so it, there was some hopefulness there, but then it didn't last very long. Uh, I think, you know, Donald Trump deserves yeah. a lot of the blame at first, uh, it, you know, an incredibly polarizing response. Um, but I think, again, as many you know, listeners and viewers at FAIR will know, the CDC and a lot of the health authorities, boy, did they blow it by being mm-hmm. often so explicitly on the blue team. It was not science first. It, it was yeah. often our progressive politics first. Um, so anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. So I think a lot yeah. about <laughs> shared, to, to run a country, you have to have some sense of shared story. You have to have some sense of shared authority. And it used to be that politics ended at the water's edge. So you could fight about politics internally, but if the president was going abroad, you know, if the country is behind them, we wouldn't try to, un- nobody tried to undercut them. And that, that, again, that's gone. Right. And that's a kind of, that phenomenon of, of not playing ball in that way is, it knows no party, right? Like both sides have done it and have proudly done it and pushed for it, you know, uh, depending on who the president yes, is. Yes, but here's yeah. where, so I, I think one of the most useful points in my in Atlantic article, that sounds stupid to say. You're the best part of my essay, no, but the, I think the most powerful, <laughs> the most powerful idea that nobody seems to pick up on, um, is the asymmetry. And I only worked this out. I had a vague feeling about that. I worked it out when I was writing, and it is this. So you mentioned structural stupidity. That's the key idea. Structural stupidity is if you have a group that requires viewpoint diversity, um, uh, they get smarter because they challenge each other, challenge confirmation bias. If you have a community or a group or institution where dissent is suppressed guaranteed the group gets stupid. The individuals can be brilliant. They can all have PhDs and lots of life experience. But once you lose dissent, and of course, I hear I'm quoting John Stuart Mill, all minus one, ably translated into Arabic by Ideas Beyond Borders. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. That's awesome. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> um, so, so if you keep your eye on that, that the need, well the need for dissent and challenge and free speech in order to make ideas better, to make the group smart, now where's the stupidity? And what I say in the article is it's asymmetric. If you look at the two parties, the Republican Party is clearly the stupid party. That is, they got rid of all their moderates. You know, if, if Trump said day is night, Republican senators would say, yes, you know, we vote unanimously that day is night. Um, and um, mm-hmm. so there's no question in my mind, the Republican Party is the stupid, crazy, irresponsible party, completely lost touch with conservatism, with Ronald Reagan, with Edmund Burke. There's nothing that I can respect about today's Republican Party, especially the Congressional Republican Party. Whereas the Democrats, whatever you want to say about them policy-wise, they have healthy debates between the the far left and the and the centrists. And guess who wins? Usually the moderates. They're usually the ones who wins. So the Democratic mm-hmm. Party has not run off the rails. It is not the stupid party. Okay, that's step one. But there's a major asymmetry, and and Democrats are always mm-hmm. pointing to the Republicans to say, look how terrible they are. Therefore, we're right, and I'm not going to listen to anything you say. And they're right that, okay. But at the same time, the Republicans are pointing to all the insane things that people on the left are doing in schools, in the health system, in the the lockdowns, the the COVID policies, Um, a lot of ideas about gender, race, immigration, a lot of the ideas on the left because no dissent is allowed on any of these issues. And if you say... You know, if you say, you know, everything is racist, we have to defund the police, 
We have to change, you know, we have to, you know, uh, you know, get people out of jail. We have to change the, you know, there may be reasons to do that. But if you literally cannot critique that idea, if you literally cannot even tweet an article, you know, why was Steve, there was a cancellation attempt on Steve Pinker. Most of the evidence was he tweeted several articles or he mentioned something in a New York Times article that, you know, mm-hmm. scientific studies. So if you literally can't even quote contrary evidence, then your side is structurally stupid. And that means that the policies you push on elementary schools, on high schools, on colleges, the policies you push are so stupid and unpopular that they almost guarantee you're going to lose elections. So, you know, that, mm-hmm. that's what I mean, that, that the Republican Party is a stupid party, but the cultural left is the stupid side of the cultural spectrum. I don't have any, I don't see problems from the cultural right. They don't have any power. But the cultural left basically has corporations, institutions, universities, museums. It's sort of got them by the, you know, by whatever part of the body you want to say. And, you know, it, it tends to produce very <laughs> bad results ultimately for the left. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see what you mean, especially with um, the, the narrative surrounding police shooting in America and how that bubbled up into actual policy, um, you know, police departments yeah. defunded, demoralized, and, and then the consequences filtering down and affecting the, the very vulnerable people who live in neighborhoods that are not so good, that cannot afford, you know, private security. And so in that sense, um, it, it came to bite them in the foot. Exactly. So, you know, people should be familiar, or people on the left should be familiar with the word Pyrrhic, like a Pyrrhic victory. I forget the origin of the Greek, you know, some Greek general or something that, you know, he won the war, he won the battle. But the cost was so great that he lost the war. And you know what I've seen happening in, in recent years is the left wins Pyrrhic victory after Pyrrhic victory. Um, and that's why, you know, that's why I think DeSantis is likely to be the next president. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. All right. I'm going to leave that there. But uh, get uh, back on the social media thing before we jump to something else. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about this. And so I noticed, for example, Twitter around 20, 2008, maybe 2009, maybe 2010, somewhere in that er, those early few years of Twitter, right? Sp- specifically Twitter. It was like a playground for mm-hmm. comedians. Mm. It was this awesome place yeah. where you can go and follow all these yeah. comedians and they would just dump their brains out in tweets. You know, something that maybe didn't work on stage or just mm. something that they just farted out while they were on the train or at the park or whatever. And it was amazing to just kind of get a glimpse into their brains. And they kind of ruled that platform. And it was just this fun, you get these fun, yeah. bite-sized, ridiculous Yeah, it was a nice place. Comedians would on. say. Yeah, it was, I mean, I found it so yeah. fun, right? It's, and, and it was a great place for engagement with people that you otherwise wouldn't have any occasion yeah. to engage with, right? And then something started to shift, as you mentioned. And it, it started to get really serious. And then all the comedians left. Right. <laughs> I think that's, that's emblematic of the issue in one direction. Um, but, but I keep thinking about, you know, the metaphor that you're using. And my metaphor is more of Prometheus. Mm. My metaphor is that social media, and maybe media in general, but social media in particular is definitely fire. Mm. We got fire and we could do all this great stuff with fire, right? We can cook great food. We can, you know, warm ourselves when it's cold. We can do all these wonderful things with fire. But we also now can have house fires mm-hmm. and buildings burning down. And we have pyromaniacs. Yeah. And and we have third degree burns and we have all this crazy stuff. And you know, just like with fire, I think it becomes incumbent upon us to use this tool responsibly, mm-hmm. to use this tool in a way where we get all the benefits and mitigate all the harm. Right. And I don't think social media, we've figured out how to do it, or we've realized that we need to do it. We kind of keep expecting someone else to do it for yeah. us. What so, do you think about so let, that? Yeah, so I love what you just said. Let me just modify it a little bit. So first, the Prometheus myth is sure. definitely a great one. It's the Frankenstein story. It's, you know, Prometheus steals fire from the gods, right. gives it to the mortals, and then he himself is tortured by the gods forever. Um, but I think that social yeah. media is not fire. It, it's the internet. The internet is the thing that you're talking about there. So let me just work this out for you. This is something I've, I've seen. There's a lot of confusion. I talk about this. Oh uh, yeah. Like no, for example, people say, true. 
thank God we had social media during COVID. Can you imagine? You know, I'm talking because I keep talking like, look what happens to kids. Kids are in terrible shape. Teenagers right. are in terrible shape. Social media is messing them up. And people yeah. say, oh, well, come on. Well, you know, do you think they should? What if they didn't have it during COVID? You know, if that was the only way they could communicate. To which I say, wait, I think you're confusing social media and the internet. Like, yeah, can you imagine if they didn't have Instagram and Facebook and, and Twitter and, and, and all they had was <laughs> Zoom and Skype and texting and telephone and multiplayer video games and Roblox and, and 50 other ways they could interact synchronously? You know, are you mm. saying if we took away this weird asynchronous way of communicating and waiting for people to rate you, like that's what they needed? No, you're wrong. Um, so what mm. I really want to convey here mm. is the, you know, we've got these three separate things. There's the internet, which is this incredible gift. And I, I have somebody do a demonstration. I say, you know, and it, imagine if a genie had come to a, come to you in the, in the, in the early nineties and said, I've got three magical boxes here and you can open one, two or three or zero. Don't have to open any, any box you open. It's going to give you something, but it's going to take 10 to 15 hours a week of your life for the rest of your life. Okay, so you decide. First box, internet. What do you think? You can open it. Are you glad we have the internet, even though you spend a lot of time on it? Raise your hand. Seriously, you guys, are you glad we have the internet? Yes, for yeah, sure. Everyone is. Yeah. Oh yeah. So the internet yeah. is fire. I'm glad we have fire. Right. Yeah, fire burns and things, but you know, of course, yeah, we're glad we have fire. Same thing for the internet. Okay. The next okay. box is the iPhone. Now, this is you know, as Steve mm. Jobs introduced it, this is, as he said, it's a phone and a camera. And an iPod, all in one, and a flashlight. You know, it's this incredible Swiss Army knife. It's got all these tools on it. So yeah. forget social media. You've got, you've got all these tools. Now, that's the second box. Now, if you open it, and you also have the internet on it, so it's going to take an additional. T- now you're spending 30 hours a week on your phone and on the internet total. What do you think? Are you glad we o- would you open that yeah. box? Or do you wish we didn't have smartphones? We had flip phones. I still would. Flip. What do you but you I'm a Luddite. Yeah, no. flip okay. for me. Yeah. You really flip? Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually okay. hate this thing. And this is a curse. This is a curse, honestly. Okay. But hold on a sec. So first of all, so, well, I hear, then, so yeah. most, when I do that, I've done this twice live. And you know, everyone says yes to internet. Uh-huh. This, they're slower. Like 70% say yes, but they're slower. Yeah. But part of what they're doing, I think, is you're saying it's a curse. <laughs> it's not this is the curse. It's the social media. Because if this was just your camera, your iPod, and a flashlight, and if this was just the four or five apps, you'd love it. That would be no problem. Um, the third box is social media. The third box is Facebook and Twitter, and uh, you know, and TikTok and all the others. Um, and now that's another ten to fifteen hours. Mm-hmm. So now we're up to forty hours a week. Now you're going to spend forty hours a week, and it's going to make uh, most uh, teen and girls be depressed and, and, and self harming, and it's going to get people fired for stupid mm-hmm. reasons, and it's going to do all kinds of terrible things. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's only going to take 10 or 15 extra hours a week of your life. What do you think? You're going to open that box? Very few <laughs> say yes. Well, uh, with the benefit of, of, you know, hindsight, like knowing what my life is like as a result right now, I would still say yes. That's the thing. I wanted to, I wanted to talk to you about this because every, everything. Oh, tell me about that. Why would you, why would you say, tell me, what do you get from social media that's so great? Everything good that has happened to me in the last mm-hmm. two years plus has been a direct result of of the things that social media allows me to have that I wouldn't be able to have. Like elsewhere. what? Give me examples. You know, contact and communication with uh, contact and communication with people who I would never meet in a million years otherwise. Um, the ability to connect with certain people who now I have you know writing gigs for them. Like I published in, I published in Newsweek and a few other places as a result of my, my engagement and also making friends. I've made friends that I never would have met before. And now we have these wonderful conversations and we have these wonderful exchanges okay. where we disagree. And so, so this is what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is that a lot of the onus is on me to mm-hmm. use it properly, right? To use another metaphor. I use another metaphor all the time that it's like a chainsaw, right? You need to know what you're doing or you will hack someone's arm off okay. or your own arm off or your own leg off or something. But if you know what you're doing, you can build a house. You can do amazing things. And so, again, you know. No, this is just, no, this is perfect because now what we have is, right, the internet is fire. We all agree we need that. That does a lot of things. 
Social media is a chainsaw. Uh-huh. I love it because that also fits with the Martin Gurry thing. It's great. Or it's, a yeah, flame It's great for tearing things down. Yeah. It's hard to build a house with a chainsaw, but it would help. To, you know, but it's uh-huh. great for cutting things down. So yeah, it's a tool, and you can use it well. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but that's the thing. I feel like what if what if our focus is misplaced? What if I mean, it's not that we shouldn't pay attention to the effects, right? Like I think you know somebody like mm-hmm. Tristan Harris is doing really wonderful work pointing out the way that these algorithms and these things are, are programmed to right. hijack our attention and do all those things. I think right. that's great. I would never say we yeah. shouldn't do those things. But I wonder if we should put more emphasis on kind of training, you know, like, hey, look, this is the way. And again, I think of it as, you know, this is an evolution of what TV yeah. was yeah. like, right? Like, okay, you're going you're gonna to get television commercials, right? right. They're going to flash uh-huh. lights at you. They're going to show people having a lot yeah. of fun. They're going to show really good looking people that you know, are, you're, all, you're already being pulled in all these directions psychologically. But if you can inoculate, inoculate yourself right. to that, if you can be mindful of those things, then you can right. watch TV without okay. going out and buying everything. Okay, that's good. Sold, so the way you're putting you know, it, or, it is possible to use it well. It takes some fair amount of discipline. Um, it, is, it, it does have dangers. Yes. If that's the case, I think I don't want my 10 year old kid on my daughter's 12 now, but I think, you know, I don't want, I don't want 10 year olds on it. And I certainly don't want the company making deals with, Mm -hmm. with 10 year old girls behind our back, luring them in in a way we can't stop unless we keep them away from the internet everywhere. We can't keep them away from fake, making fake accounts. Um, I I think you hit on a term, you said it takes discipline, right? I think, and and I think that's very key because I know I don't have discipline in in that area. So this is why I don't have Instagram and, and, you know, being a millennial, one of the first questions, like people before they ask for anything, the first question is you meet a stranger, you start, you strike up a conversation. The first question is what's your Instagram? Really? Oh, wow. Yeah. Generally, not even your number. It's a totally different world. Um, and I'm oh, like, you, I, you're saying everyone assumes, like everyone assumes if they meet you, they assume you're on Instagram. Wow. Yep. And when I say wow. I, I don't have it, there's mm-hmm. usually, you know, like shock. What? Like you don't mm-hmm. exist then. Like, you know, and, um, <laughs> and in part, like my, the, the reason that I had shunned Instagram, um, was I, I didn't like what it incentivized because I, mm-hmm. I, I do yeah. see people generally when they're, you know, in a place that they're somewhat amazed, there's some positive emotion there their mm-hmm. instinct is to think about how to frame that shot for yes. the gram oh. right and I so know. it I trains know. your mind to to not to precisely do the the exact thing that you should be doing if you do not want to be present in the moment yeah. and that's and right. that that's why I, I i shunned it um and in your yeah. work on instagram especially uh you know linking a uh, teenager especially for for girls um suicides and bad yeah. mental health outcomes to yeah. this platform is very uh, is very telling. I, I'm actually interested also in TikTok because I think there's a bit of a McLuhan kind of medium is the message um, mm-hmm. problem oh, yeah. with these platforms because all the, all the platforms are different, right? And so Twitter incentivizes something else. I am on Twitter mm-hmm. um, and, and I know what it incentivizes in me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Instagram is something else, and then TikTok <laughs> is something else because that's more video. That's that's a more interactive, um, you know, addictive. I think actually think TikTok is you know hits the oh, dopamine a little addictive. bit right. more. Yeah, yep. and yep. and then I wonder if you have looked at Tumblr because Tumblr is an interesting comparison. It's 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 not uh, you don't link your identity to it, right? It's actually mm-hmm. anonymous. Uh, you, you have like usernames and things like that, and I wonder. You know, you're looking at mental health and social media. Have you done cross-platform comparisons? And yeah, no, that's that, that's right. This is this is where we should we should go now in our conversation, and where we need to go as a society is looking is looking. You know, it's not all the internet. It's not all social media. It's different kinds of social media. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so after right after I published the Atlantic article, mm-hmm. somebody wrote to me and said, um, "You didn't mention Tumblr. Tumblr is where the lab leak happened. Uh, lab leak, I mean, the weird." like the weird morality that came onto campus, um, it actually came from Tumblr. There was no, I said they sent me an article, I can't remember where it was. Uh, the idea was, so Tumblr is different from all the other platforms because as you say, it's not, it, first of all, it's not real identity and it's not about the social network. You don't find it because someone you know is on it. You mm-hmm. find it originally because you, you're fans of the same performer or sports team. It was, about, it was a, fan, a fan world. And then parts of it became political issues. So you could be on, you know, global warming Tumblr or trans Tumblr or, but it was very political. 
And this is what, and so one thing we know is that when all the kids got on phones, the boys went for video games and YouTube. They preferentially use those. The girls went for the visual ones. They went for Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest, those three. And so, um, and Tumblr was the furthest left of them, I believe, I'm told. I've, I've never been on it. But Tumblr kind of nurtured, it wasn't a community of people who were connected. It was a, it was a, people, a community of people who cared a lot about a particular issue mm. and who shared ideas about intersectionality and power and privilege and oppression. Um, and this, I think, might help explain, first, why these ideas, they were not there on campus in 2012, or I should say they were contained in about five departments as they've been mm. for decades. But suddenly they just poured out everywhere in 2014, 2015. They, you know, it's, it's basically two years, so quick. Um, but I think it's credible that Tumblr played a role as like nurturing the particular virus that then sort of took over universities. So Tumblr, I think, was the worst for that. Conversely, at the other end, let's look at LinkedIn. So, uh, Angel, you said all these good things happen. You met all these people. Now, you could have met them on LinkedIn. Now, LinkedIn is probably for older, more professional people than artsy, you know, artsy millennials. Um, or I'm guessing about you. I don't know, but <laughs> you guessed pretty <laughs> but, good. But <laughs> um, um, my point is that right. We shouldn't just say social media. We should say imagine a platform whose business model required spectacle. Mm. So um, that would be not LinkedIn. That would be Facebook, Twitter, all those. Um, so, at, so to go back to your chainsaw metaphor. Yeah. Imagine one company makes chainsaws, but what they're incentivized to do is make the best chainsaw for you. They think about your needs. What do you want to do? And they make a chainsaw that helps you cut down trees. Okay. So that's one company you can buy from. The other company has a very different business model. They don't make their money by selling to you. They sell from audience effects. They, they get their money from audience effects. So what they want, they want a chainsaw that, l that lashes out, and causes blood, and other people come looking like, wow, look at that. Oh, my God, look at this chainsaw <laughs> accident, man. And then, you know, you, you share it, you retweet it. And so they make their money not from helping you, but by attracting eyeballs. Right. Um, so we're going a little far out with our metaphors here, but mm -hmm. that's, my, that's my metaphor. Facebook, social media is not fire. It's chainsaws. Yeah. And LinkedIn is a good chainsaw. Uh, Instagram is a bad chainsaw. Yeah. No, I can see it. Um, I guess I'm like self, I, I'm doing a lot of it myself. It's kind of the the thing of, you know, some people can't take money out of the bank mm -hmm. and have it in their wallet because then they're going to spend it. Whereas I can have 60 bucks in my wallet and never spend it because <laughs> I could just do that. And maybe, maybe there's something about me that's weird and that other people, <laughs> other people have trouble. I don't know. Well, actually, yeah. No, but the self the self control is is a big one, and that's and that's the so that's the same. You know, look, I teach in a business school. Yeah. I teach a business ethics mm -hmm. class, and there are certain industries: gambling, cigarettes, and um, um, alcohol, being the three preeminent ones, where most of their profit comes from a small number of people whose life they are ruining. So, if you got rid of the alcoholics, yeah, alcohol companies would go out of business. Most of them. If you got rid of the problem gamblers, casinos would shut mm -hmm. down. Um, so there are, you know, now most people, I, you know, I love alcohol. Most people love it. Most people have no problem with it. Um, but these things are attractive nuisances. Yeah. They, they especially, uh, make money off of addicted people. And the fact that there are no age restrictions and the industry is fighting age restrictions means, um, that our children are having horrendous rates of depression, anxiety, self-harm, and suicide. Yeah, I, I do think it takes a tremendous amount of restraint uh, to do what Angel does, to use social media in a way that, you know, expands his intellectual life and, and, and social life. And in part, I think community building is actually something that social media does very well, right? And so if you look back um, 2010, 11, the Arab Spring ushered in so much mm. um, hope about the power mm -hmm. of, of using social media to organize. And I had um, recently, I mean, not recent, a few months ago, I, I tweeted this thing. I said, the best thing about the internet is that people who felt completely alone can find a community that shares mm -hmm. their own worldview and organize. The worst thing about the internet is that people who felt completely alone can find a community that shares their worldview oh. and organize. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I'm wondering, <laughs> you know, you, you wrote in your article about, about reforms, but mm -hmm. how can yeah. we reform social media in particular um, to make sure that there's just the best thing about the internet yeah. and not the worst thing about it. Sure. So a few of them are easy. Um, so the age issue, I mean, that's just mm. so easy. Um, you know, 
we don't let kids buy porn magazines. We don't let them buy cigarettes. Uh, we don't let them go to prostitutes, even in Nevada, where it's legal for adults. There's a lot of things that we think 10-year-olds shouldn't be doing. Um, and, you know, 10 years ago, we didn't know. We thought, you know, posting photos of themselves, posting videos of themselves dancing, we didn't think that there'd be all these men ogling these little girls and then trying to contact them. Um, so the idea that there's just no age restriction, yeah. that the law is set to be 13 with zero enforcement is absurd and has to change. And the fact that the suicide rate has more than doubled, um, um, the, the self-harm rate has tripled for young girls. Um, you know, we have a catastrophe. So the, uh, the hospital admission rate is more, uh, more than 200%. Um, for, and this is true in Canada and the UK as well. Um, so... Uh, we have a catastrophe that's destroying teen girls in this country, large, large number. You know, maybe not a majority, but more than a third. More than a third are damaged by this. Um, I can't, you know, almost every time I talk to a woman in her 40s or 50s and I find out she has a daughter, I say, how's she doing? Half the time, it's hospitalization. It, I, I'm exaggerating. It seems like half the time. It can't be 50%. But it's frequent that her daughter is suicidal. Right. Um, and... Um, so that has to change. That, I think, is easy. We have to raise the age to 16 or 18 uh, with enforcement. Lots of industries have done it. There are multiple ways to do age verification. So that's, that one, I think, is easy and has to be done. Wait, wait, Professor Hyatt, I have, I have a question specifically about that. How, sure. do, you, how do you delineate? Because I, you, you're looking at suicide rates of girls using Instagram and girls who are not using no, Instagram. No, that we don't know. We don't have good data. No. Okay. okay. I wish we had that. The companies know, right. but we don't. All okay. we have yeah. is... Big studies in the UK and America. How many hours a week do you spend on social media? How many hours do you spend a week in church? Right. You know, and then how's your mental health? And so, you know, these are very crude measures, and we look at the correlations. They're also experiments. Um, so, if listeners actually, if you go to jonathanheightcom slash social media, I have everything there. Um, I, I put everything together in a 12-page memo. I gave a testimony at the Senate Judiciary Committee. I put it all in a very short, succinct memo. So just go to jonathanite.com slash social media. You'll see all the stats mm. laid out uh, there. So the age one, I think, has to be done. It's bipartisan. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's an emergency. This should be done tomorrow. Mm. Um, uh, okay. Now, how do you, for now, just now for adults, for people over 18, so I'm, I, I have a lot of libertarian friends. Um, I'm very reluctant to tell adults what to do. I would lose all of my libertarian friends if I tried. Um, and, and I, you know, and I, I, I generally <laughs> share, share their values. So I'm not, I'm, I don't want to tell 18 you know, adults what they can. But at the same time, there are communities organized on certain principles. And as a social psychologist, I can say, if we can bring together a community in which everyone is anonymous and they have no past, they have no future, and they only have a short, uh, you know, 240 characters, and everything is public. That sounds to me like the worst possible <laughs> forum in which people can interact. That is like a definition almost of like the Roman Colosseum. We'll have a bunch of short acts. We'll have people killing lions, lions killing people. We, you know, push them off the stage, another one. You know, these things that, you know, each, each car wreck, it lasts, you know, a day or two, and then it goes on. So, um, so Twitter is about the worst possible way you could have a public square or democratic discussion or any Twitter, I think is, is really damaging to, to institutions and democracy. Um, mm. uh, whereas you could do, you know, if you, people had a sense of that we're tied together, we're a community, we're responsible to each other. Uh, and so uh, the other extreme would be LinkedIn, uh, where you need to be professional, responsible, civil, polite, uh, you can make your case, you can publish things, you can put up all kinds of things, and if they're popular, other people will share them. Uh, but it's very, very civil and constructive. So mm -hmm. it, so all of this is about is there, there are architectural features of systems. And then the question is, what's the role of the federal government or any government? Um, shouldn't this all just be left to the private, to private industry? And that gives us the innovation. I certainly wouldn't want you know, in, in Britain, they have the BBC and they have regulated, uh, they have regula regulated televisions, all that. I, I don't want that. I don't say we need, you know, government, social media. But I do think that if a company wants this amazing special protection that only the gun industry has, which is, you can't sue us. You can't sue us because, you know, we have a congressional influence. And so we got this thing passed in Section 230. Uh, and there's a reason for Section 230. It's a reason why we don't hold Twitter mm -hmm. responsible for everything anyone posts. Right. So, right. but if you want Section 230 protection, you actually have some minimal responsibilities, like to verify that your users are people um, and that they're over 18. Um, 
And if they make death threats, you know, you, you have a way to stop them from just coming back on tomorrow with a different, different identity. So I think the biggest thing we could do is identity mm-hmm. verification or authentication. Even Elon Musk wants a form of this. Um, so at least verify that they're a human, not a bot. Um, verify that they're over 18. There's a bunch of different ways to do that. Um, I think you should verify that they're in a particular country. Um, and I think um, there are some ways you verify. And I'm, I'm talking not that you give your driver's license to Facebook, although that would be one of seven different ways. But uh, if you want to open an account at Facebook or in, Instagram or anywhere, it kicks it over to a third party place that verifies that you're a human being. And if necessary, that you're old enough. And then if you pass, it then passes it back and says, yes, this person can open an account. That, I think, would make a huge difference. Uh, whereas what we have now is any troll, any person with a personality disorder, any Russian agent can create hundreds of accounts and harass millions of people. You've, you've touched on it a couple of times, uh, but this idea of a, a shared story, a shared sense mm-hmm. of kind of community and purpose, right? And that is something that I think if it existed outside of these social media platforms, or if it was more robust, then it would it would affect the way we operate within these social media platforms. It would be more difficult for for how crazy it actually is to be that crazy, in my view. And I'm curious what you think about, you know, um, when you wrote the Righteous Mind, you you know you, you you talked earlier about the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, but that and that's distinct from liberalism and conservatism, right? And if I remember right, your your basic point with the righteous mind is that we all hold the same set of fundamental values. It's just yeah. that the dials are, yeah. are kind of turned differently depending on a variety of things, experience, mm-hmm. temperament, et cetera, right? Yeah. Um, correct me if I'm wrong there. But it seems to me, it seems to me that some of those dials have have been drastically changed mm-hmm. for either camp. And it may be, we may be in a place where liberalism and conservatism are unrecognizable, um, you know, with, with respect to the, the categories you were using in your analysis. And I'm curious if what, what we should do about that. It seems to me, we were just talking with Peter Bogosian and he seemed to draw the line at, you know, the, the, the principal divide seems to be, I trust Mm -hmm. institutions versus I do not trust institutions. And I'm, I'm curious if you think we need to yeah. reassess this, if if things have shifted so drastically that we need to reassess all this. So the argument I'm trying to make in, in my the book I'm writing, which is Life After Babel, Adapting to a World We May Never Again Share, is that since about 2014, we live in the post-Babel mm-hmm. world. So you know, I grew up in the pre-Babel world, uh, where there were possibilities of shared meanings, and there were newspapers that had some authority, and you know, if someone accused you of something, you could defend yourself. And, you know, it was a world that was in some way connected to the world that we evolved in thousands, you know, millions of years ago, thousands of years ago. And then in 20, around 2012, 2014, 15, things changed. And now we live in this weird world with all these ex- exponential features that we, our brains don't work well with. Um, and so one of them is that while it looks to you as though the settings have changed, it looks to you as though liberals and conservatives have changed. Mm-hmm. But I, I think that's not exactly what happened. Rather, um, America, we happen to have mm-hmm. two parties, which is a terrible number. You know, one is the worst number of political parties in the country, but two is the second worst number. Um, in, in Europe, they have multiple parties, and parliamentary <laughs> right. systems are much more robust against polarization. Two is maximally efficient at, at creating polarization and hatred and dysfunction. And so our two parties, yeah. though, have always been um, tents that included multiple kinds of people, multiple kinds of issues. What happened was on the left, you always had a range of people, including you know the radicals and communists and people in Brooklyn who don't shave or shower or change their clothing, and, you know. But they weren't in charge. Like you know, it was like it was more you know center left, you know Ivy League educated, uh, you know progressives at the New York Times. I mean, so you, you always had multiple people voting for the Democrats. But the far left never really had any power. Um, and as I said before, the far left is not running things on the Democrats, but they have a lot more cultural power now. So the left has super empowered its illiberal wing. And you know, we all see, all of us in the fair community, we all see that you know, wokeness is about as opposed to liberalism, as authoritarianism or fascism are. These are 
doctrines that believe in using force to compel people to do your bidding, to, to live according to your ideals. So, uh, so the left has super empowered um, its, 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 its far left wing, not in the Democratic Party necessarily, but in the culture. On the right, you, Reagan put together this mm. very successful electoral coalition of the business conservatives who are fine with gay marriage. They're, you know, a lot of the libertarians and the true social conservatives, the Edmund Burke, you know, George W, George H. W. Bush wouldn't be prudent. It's the old Saturday Night Live joke. You know, they're like the social conservatives. I have a lot of respect for them. <laughs> Read Edmund Burke. You know, he understood you don't go tearing down institutions. You have to change them gradually. Um, so that's like the, the intellectual core the, or the, the, the heart of conservatism is the, the, the Burkean conservatives. But then you also have the authoritarians who used to be, there used to be a lot on the Democratic side as well. They were typically more like, you know, working class, blue collar people who had strong beliefs about immigration. Uh, they would say things that, that many would consider racist. They wanted more restrictions. Um, I'm a big fan of Karen Stenner, the political scientist who studies authoritarianism. As a predisposition, they when they feel when when about twenty percent of the population when they feel that we're losing any sense of moral coherence when they what, what she calls normative threat or moral threat, you know uh, what did, what did Trump say in his opening his opening statement of his campaign? Mexican rapists, you know, they're coming across the border. This was like totally targeted at the authoritarian receptor to activate the authoritarian mindset. So anyway, Reagan brought them especially into the Republican Party. So you've got, you had the, sort of the libertarian business conservative, laissez-faire people, the social conservatives, and the more authoritarians. Um, that was a big and very successful electoral coalition. It's, and it's um, and what social media, I believe, has done, the post babel world has done, is it's given the authoritarians enormous power. Um, the fact that, you know, so Steve Bannon is one of them. Um, what's his name? Oh, she, what's the guy? The guy who coined the, the metaphor, um, the flight 93 election. Uh, if, the, if this is, you know, if, the, if we're flight 93, we're going to crash. You got to rush the cockpit. If Hillary Clinton gets, gets controls, America's dead. Therefore vote Trump. That was a very powerful argument. Um, anyway, my point is it's not that conservatism, liberalism changed. It's that the two mm -hmm. coalitions have changed so that the extreme members now have so much more power than they did before social media. John, how do you think about, so we're in a post babel world, um, as you say, but there are still some countries right now on this planet that are pre babel And yeah. we are going head to head with them geopolitically. Who wins out? Yeah, well, if you're talking, well, China is the obvious country that I think you're talking about, because China is different yeah. from all other countries. Uh, I mean, the Chinese, you know, the Russians. They have the one Chinese, narrative, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So, you know, as Tristan Harris puts it, um, the technology, especially social media, is making democracy much worse democracy. And by the same token, the technology is allowing the Chinese Communist Party to have much better totalitarianism. And by mm -hmm. better, I don't mean for human beings. I efficient, mean yeah. Efficient, effective. And so just, you know, for example... They're able to say, uh, on, you know, uh, only a certain amount of video games, and then they cut the kids off. Their, yeah. their TikTok is is pretty wholesome and healthy, and yeah. they whereas they let it rip here, you know, they let all the garbage rip here, which is uh, so. So um, so clearly, the technology points to China having having uh, uh, being in better shape. Uh, I, I can't weigh in on on which country wins thirty years from now, just because China has all kinds of other problems. The, the declining birth rate, the aging pop, you know, so I can't say that China's going to win. I really don't know. But what I can say is that when I see the way the Chinese mm -hmm. Communist Party is able to anticipate, they see what's happening, and they actively work to maintain a sense of coherence, national pride, uh, uh, mental health. They're doing things. They're, the technology helps them be more effective. And for us, I think it's doing us in. Um, I think we're going to have some pretty serious um, I can't, I'm not sure I can say collapse per se, but I, you know, the model that I'm, I'm sort of playing with that I, I, I bring out on shows like this, and then I'll, we'll see if people on, on Twitter or elsewhere say, you know, argue back and say why I'm wrong. But I think the model to look for is something like Venezuela or, or Argentina, because these are countries that have had a lot of prosperity in their past. Um, and they've also had democracy and they've also had authoritarianism. And we're a country that has had the most prosperity of any country other than oil countries. Um, and we've had nothing but democracy, but that's not eternal or inevitable. 
And so I think we're going to have a lot more political violence, you know, as we did in the 70s, early 70s, late 60s. Um, it could get a lot more serious because now they're much better organized. The weather underground couldn't, there's no way they could do any sort of big thing. You know, they were literally hiding from the police all the time. Um, whereas, you know, a lot of the right wing militias now, they're called accelerationist. That is, uh, so I read um, uh, Barbara Walters' book, How Civil War Started, absolutely terrifying because we are on the very path that she describes that civil wars after the Second World War, civil wars have a certain pattern to them. You have a declining democracy um, or a rise or rising up from autocracy, but you have a middle zone, anocracy. Um, you have militias and you have identity-based politics, not issue-based, identity-based. And so a lot of this points to the right, especially the militias, especially are, are on the right, but the identity-based politics that the left is pushing they're doing everything they can to make these right-wing militia people try to launch a civil war. You know, it, so anyway, um, I think we have a lot of turmoil in our future. Um, mm. But you know, history goes in cycles, and we're, we had a long, wonderful cycle with you know peak in the 1990s of you know peace breaking out everywhere, and now we're due for a crack up, which many theories have predicted. Um, it won't go on forever, um, but it, you know, there's no way to know how long it'll last. Other than I think it's going to be more than ten years. I don't think. You know, I, mm. I think the next 10 years will be crazy compared to what we've gone through in the last few years. And, and, and so wait, so the grand unified theory of why everything sucks for you <laughs> is, is social media, that if we didn't have social media, that this decline would not be as hastened or yeah, so, really right. so Yeah, I, so I hope I don't have a grand unified theory, although I, sometimes <laughs> it might seem like I'm talking that way. I've been focused on social media because that's the thing that made it so sharp in 2014. <laughs> like everything went crazy around 2014. That's okay. social media. But, um, but I am a big fan of Peter Turchin, mm. who has books like War, War and Peace and War, and cycle, you know, he mm. writes about cycles of history. Um, and Strau and House uh, had a book in the 1990s. Um, there's a 14th century Muslim scholar, Ibn Khaldun. A lot of people have observed that there, there are cycles of history. And what happens is you have a crisis, a, a generation meets the crisis, and they build institutions. And then you have, you know, you have a, a two or three generations of prosperity. And that happened to us with World War II and the post-war world. But that can never last forever. It can't even last 100 years. It, it just lasts two or three generations, and then it begins to crack up. And so that's where we are. And, and that was true before social media. So it's not, it's not that social media caused this. We were due for the normal, you know, the post-World War II world was going to crack up. Um, mm. But if it's happening when mm. suddenly we're blind, like with like, you know, dust thrown in our eyes, and we're disoriented, and we're full of anger, that didn't have to be. That, I think, is social media. So um, so we're going down. We would have been going down anyway. Uh, Peter Turchin predicted in 2010 that the big crack up would be 2020. So that would be a peak year. Strauen House said 2025, a great gate in history will open up. Uh, they said that in the 90s. So sometime in the 2020s is like the peak chaos. Um, and then how what will happen, nobody knows. Uh, but I think social media makes it much more likely that the bottom will be far down compared to where it would have been. <laughs> so what, what can we do about this? I'm feeling like uh, I'm going to be around. So I kind of want to know, what do I, what do I do here? So no, so look, okay. You know what? Okay, wait. So I actually you know I have, okay. So let me, let me, let me, I don't, I don't want to leave. I don't know how much more time we have, but I don't want to leave the largely millennial, I don't know if it's largely millennial, but I don't want to leave yeah. the, the audience. Like I want to shock people to say, we can't just do business as usual. Uh, the trends are really, really bad. I mean, they're much worse than I think that people right. realize. Um, um, but it's not like we're going to die. That is, um, you know, in Argentina and Venezuela, you know, people didn't die. The countries are still there. I mean, okay, Venezuela is in really bad shape, but that's yeah. economic catastrophe. And we're, and we have so you know we're not going to yeah. be like Venezuela. Right. We have a very good private sector. We have very vibrant economy. So we'd be more like Argentina, but if Argentina had a better economy. Um, so it's not that we're going to die. Um, it's that a lot of things we take, we took for granted are going to break. And what that means is that, is that your generation, so it's millennials and Gen Z after you, um, you actually have the chance to matter. You actually have the chance to build whatever comes next. I was born in 1963. I just got to enjoy the fruits of my parents' labor. I didn't have to build anything. Everything was sort of easy and boring, you know, in the 80s and 90s. I mean, it was fun in the 90s, but it didn't, have, it didn't take any work. Um, but you guys are going to have to work. And what that means is you have a chance to be heroes. You have a chance to be like my parents' generation, my grandparents' generation. You know, they, you know, 
however bad you think things are, it's nothing mm. compared to the Great Depression and World War II, nothing. Um, so you know, things are going to break and then they'll get rebuilt. They're not going to stay broken forever. So your generation has a chance to matter. And to mm. do that, to do it well, you have to rid yourself of structural stupidity. If you go into this in just a cultural mindset, and especially, I, I'd say this directly to members of the FAIR community, you know, FAIR, the general vibe is anti-woke. Now, I hate wokeness as much as everybody else, but I try not to do culture war. I try to just understand everything. And, you, you know, with a real war, you can win by literally killing all of your enemies. With a culture war, you can't. The more you hit them, the stronger they get. So, um, so I would urge especially people involved in FAIR, you know, that... This cultural problem is, is damaging our institutions, but the people doing it are not bad people. We have to think sociologically and social psychologically, and we have to figure how do we change things to defang them? How do we change things to make our institutions smart? Um, and so mm. while I, you know, I don't think that fair is structurally stupid, that is, I've never felt in any of the communities that you and I are in, I've never felt that if I dissent, like, I, like what I just said, I've never felt like if I criticize, oh, I'm gonna be kicked out, like, oh, I'm gonna be, no. You know, it is a, it is a very open, intellectually open community, um, but um, but I would yeah. you know urge people to, to you know read as widely as you can, talk to people as widely as you can, and really have like an attitude of not of anger but of compassion. I mean, our species are are civil. I mean, we're in trouble, um, and everybody's uh, hurting, and and there's no you know there's yeah. no clear I mean, there's no clear mm. villain here. It's a systemic problem. Mm. Well, you're you're following the trend of our, our recent episodes where you preempt that? the last question before we ask it, uh, and the, the final question we ask every guest is, uh, as you know, our focus at Fair is providing what we uh-huh. call a pro-human approach to the issues of the day, the issues that we've been talking about, all these difficult things, and so the question would be, mm-hmm. what what does pro-human mean to you, and how can everyday mm-hmm. people apply yeah. that pro-human principle. Yeah, no, that's a good, I didn't know that was the last question. What does pro-human mean? Um, so I, I see humanity as this long, incredible story. Um, I have a real sense of kinship with, you know, our ancestors going back millions of years. And, and I think about, about humans you know, struggling to to find food every day and make fire every day. And I look at how easy we have it and how far we've come. And I'm filled with awe. And I have a strong sense that we're living so far above our design specifications that it's miraculous. And so now we're, we're falling down now somewhat, but we're still way above where we should be. Um, so I guess pro-human means to identify with the long and incredible story of our species. We're humans, all of us. We're all humans. Um, and that means that we're complicated. We are prone to um, arrogance and confirmation bias. So we need to be more humble. Um, um, we, we have these deep social needs that, especially in modern life, we're starving to, to have fulfilled. So I guess this is part of what keeps me from I, I never feel anger. I like never get angry. Um, and, and I think part of it is maybe it's just as a social scientist, it's just like, it's this incredibly fascinating story. And right now we're in a very difficult part of the plot. Um, and, um, you know, it's going to work out someday. I don't know when, I don't know what the next chapters are. And the next chapter probably is going to be one of the darker chapters in the, in the book, certainly in the more recent chapters of the book. Um, so I don't know what it's mm-hmm. going to be. But if we approach it with a sense of, of humility, um, you know, and that's, and I haven't mentioned Heterox Academy yet. I don't think I mentioned much. Um, you know, that's part of what we're, we're trying to do is, you know, humility, curiosity, and a commitment that, you know, we can, we, you know, we can figure this out if we, if we think together. That's at least what we're trying to do at universities. So that's a bit scattered, but I do want to end with this one particular quote that I love that, I, that, that really helps me. Um, so here it is. It's from, so it's from Joseph Campbell who, I don't know if you know who he is, but he was a very famous, uh, uh, he, he studied mythology in the 20th sure. century. He was at, um, which school was it? Yep, exactly. He wrote The Hero of a Thousand Faces. Hero of a Thousand Faces. Uh, and there was a PBS special on him, right. which I watched in the 90s, and it really affected me. And I, I vaguely remember this line. I looked it up and I found it. 
So he says in one of the interviews, he says, the, the, the lesson of the hero's journey, the lesson that you get from study, because the hero stories are very similar around the world. Again, it's part of the human story. He says, the lesson is this, quote, he says, participate joyfully in the sorrows of the world. We cannot cure the world of sorrows, but we can choose to live in joy. Uh, the warrior's approach is to say yes to life, yes to it all. So that's where we are. This is, this is our lot. This is the hand we've been dealt. It's going to be it's going to be difficult, uh, but you have no choice but to say yes to it. Beautifully put. <laughs> Jonathan Haidt, thank you so much for joining us on Fair Perspectives. My pleasure, Angel. My pleasure, Melissa. Thank you for listening to Fair Perspectives. If you'd like to support the show, you can do it by subscribing on YouTube and on your favorite podcast platform and leaving us a positive rating and review. You can also access exclusive podcast content, such as Q&As and bonus episodes, by visiting us and signing up at fairperspectives.org. For weekly fair news and opinion pieces by members of the fair community, visit our Substack at fairforall.substack.com and tune into Fair News Weekly wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to join or support the pro-human movement, visit us at fairforall.org slash join us. Thanks again and see you next time.